and, uh, and create something different. They change all these shapes of energy. They take this fire and ice. Um, a giant appears, a man appears, a cow appears. They all kind of tie together. I go into it in great detail in chapter one. Basically, it all boils down to the uh, a theory from a guy at MIT who says that you know matter will assume a shape most conducive to its ability to disperse the energy that it resides in. Right. So if you're shining light on something all the time, eventually there's going to be a way to harness that energy. If it's always bathed in cosmic rays, eventually it's going to develop a shield against that. Human beings have evolved and developed. We can walk around in the sunlight. Our skin will tan. We'll get burned. We can see in the in the uh, way the color wavelength of light, um, as opposed to say a bat, which grew up in an absence of that energy, and it uses vocal cords. Anyway, the first chapter of that book goes into great detail and uses this new theory. It's kind of based on entropy and the second law of thermodynamics, but it's but it really ties a bunch of things together about the creation myth. <laughs> it's always kind of hard to rectify in the, in Austria. That's he just appears. How does he just appear? Well, this theory it kind of stems from the Yuri Miller experiments, but it kind of ties it all together. But this chapter here, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about something else, something truly fantastic, I think. And part of it is a dream, and I'm. I'm usually hesitant to talk about dreams because everybody, there was a time in Eden Ray when I said, oh no, we didn't, nobody talks about dreams, but if you look at the lore and pay attention to it, they were all paying attention to their dreams. There was, uh, it was, it was that connection to other realms of thought and ideas that didn't necessarily reside in our current circumstances or wasn't determined by whatever substance they were ingesting uh, for their spiritual experience in their ceremonies. What's going on, man? <laughs> but the flows of energy, the cycles of life, the birds and migrating mammal, mammals, trees, and the sunshine, which shines a light upon all of it. All of those things kind of tie together. There's a, a, constant, a sense of a constantly moving flow of, of life across the surface of the world. But there's also one in the ocean. And that that captivates my imagination even more. The Gulf Stream, the current that goes from the Gulf of Mexico and around Florida and goes up to England, that is the reason England is so foggy, has the same volume of, river, of, of water as 300 Amazon rivers. So this is not no small thing. See, these, these actions against man and nature, um, this is, man has typically throughout history decided to conquer that. Whereas in the lore, it's not necessary to conquering. He is reshaping. He is changing. He is building. He is moving flows of energy to suit his need. And we also have that capability. But it gets, it gets kind of off course in history. And they, this, this, um, men decide what will be conquered. And all through history, you can see it's a, it's, it's this bright red streak, the industrial revolution, communism, uh, monotheism, Christianity, Muslim, uh, Islam, all of them are these huge, painful experiences in the human experience that are just covered in, in the blood of people. Just this wonderful, powerful sacrifice of millions of humans for something else. <laughs> and only rarely in history have we seen men turn that powerful and penetrating gaze of the sunlight on our minds onto ourselves. Those few that have done it have become legend. And sometimes they're a complete fabrication. But the truth of their words are so powerful that they can be used by lesser men to achieve different goals. But it's really, it's a teardrop of hope in a poisoned well, I would look at. You know, if you look at the world today, you have to wonder what's really going to save this. What's going to change this so that we might, our children might have a future and have some kind of hope. Because there's, you know, if you if you drop a drop of ink in a well, you can't undo that. That ink is there. You can pour a lot of water into it, but it's still there. It's the same thing with regards to our weird orlog, all these other concepts that, that govern the powers of our life, the flows of energy. <laughs> you can't undo those deeds. And we are our deeds. But there is... 
there's no way for us to cover that up. There's no white clay to cover the roots of our tree in that madness of expectation. And most of what this wonderful streak of, his, of blood across the annals of history, it's a streak of expectation. Every man expected to have something and he would convince other men that you go do it and you can, you can enjoy it too. <laughs> How shameful that spotlight must appear the one which casts a beam of integrity upon the shallow grave of our dreams. What great shadows have been cast because of our blindness to the world we live in? What kind of pain and confusion have we opened the door to in not only our own lives, but in the lives of countless others? Some would be tempted to say, how sad that we have created a world where compassion is no longer a viable force for good, where greed has shackled the minds of men more effectively than any slaver ever could. And they have. You see people get up every day, go drive across town in an environment they can't stand, cussing about a job they hate, labor at it all day long, and then bitch on the drive all the way home. That, that's, that's a shackle. That's something people have tied themselves to. And for the life of me, I can't understand why people don't figure out how to say, okay, that's not what I really like. I need to go do this over here. Largely they do it because somebody else might say, oh, well, you, you can't do that. Why would you want to do that? Nobody else is doing that. But a slaver, one thing he can't steal from, from man is his faith. He might work him to death, but he would always have hope that if he had faith, he might be able to do something. It's that great opiate of the masses. Let him have it. See, the driving thought processes of our minds are just to take. We have been in this generation, in this, in this last hundred years, to consume, regardless of the consequences. Technology will save us, they hope, and it will, but not in the way we envision. Perhaps it will all collapse. We might get to do it all over again. Um, surely we have the example of Odin, Billy, and Vey as to how we might shape the energies of the world we would wish to live in. See, if it all collapses tomorrow, I might get to try it again, and I won't have to change a thing about who and what I am to keep moving forward. Usually we refer to this as a Ragnarok. What's up, man? I've spoken many times about a personal Ragnarok, where our own thinking has brought us to a, pain, a crossroad so painful and the destruction of our personal lives so complete that we absolutely had to find a new spiritual path. When I was a teenager, Megadeth made a damn song about it. Peace sells. I don't know how many people remember that, but one of the stanzas says, if there's a new way, I'll be the first in line. It better work this time. Now, imagine a world where such an idea has now become a commonplace thought. We're all finding a new path. Somebody made a song about it 20 years ago, a hard rock song. It was excessive. Everybody kind of laughed about it. Who could be serious about that? And now here we are as 20 years, 25, 30 years later, as an adult, all of a sudden, that's a real option. There's been, there was something happened in that energy. These words were spoken. These waves of energy were sent out. All of a sudden, things are changing for us. Because back then, Tipper Gore was in front of Congress saying, this is devil worship. We need to get this rated. Now, all of a sudden, it's just, here we go. See, we know all these things. This is nothing more than stating the obvious. But given <laughs> that I have spent a good bit of time in the writing of this book to help us understand, maybe even to truly comprehend what we are capable of, I want to make sure that in this lore I find that way which will work this time. It's got to be the thing. Not because I said it, but because everybody in here might take a look at it and see something. Something might click. Something might understand. They might understand some aspect of some action of some God who in, they might be able to emulate in their lives and maybe take off in a new, more powerful direction of their own accord. Not because somebody else says you have to do this, so this over here will let you have that. It's not how it works. But I see such a way in the actions of gods. I see a way in the harnessing of the energies around us. I see such a way when I draw the parallels between the gods and the tug of war between our own thought process. I see it in almost every aspect of the lore of the gods. <laughs> and one other place that I saw it was, like I said, in a dream. Now, when I was new in Austria, and it's taken me probably 10 years to even discuss these kinds of things. When I was new in Austria, I would journal my dreams. I would write them down. And, and sometimes, you know, when you get that really good sound sleep, you have like one of those Cecil B. DeMille epic dreams where it's real clear and you're not sure if you're awake and then you wake up and you're surprised and one of those real clear kind of dreams. I write them down. I wrote them down for a long time. <laughs> one dream in particular that I had 
trouble understanding until I began really to write this book is this. The scene was this. I was in a fen and there were like the humps of grass, like the tussocks that are common in marshes. And there's a woman sitting in a bright shadow. I never see who she is. She's just sitting there. And she said to me, she said, look at the whale. See how it has adapted from a creature which used to walk on land to one which now thrives in the ocean. And she touched me between my shoulder blades and she said, you have strong gills or breathers or something. I'm not really sure what that was. But at that point, we looked at a young woman that I knew. and she, The woman was in her 20s. But in the dream, she was hunched over and crippled and, and hurting herself. Even though she was a powerfully, physically impressive uh, specimen of an individual, her thought process had hunkered her down to a point where she just kind of meandered through life. It was a great struggle every step. Though she was young, she seemed to be stooped with age. Her own thoughts were bringing her down. She could not adapt to growing up. She always saw the sad, the painful, the negative things about life, and it was crippling her spirit. And see, I see it crippling the spirit of many people around me. I'll let you figure out what you want from the dream, but it's inspired me in many ways primarily in the observation of my own thoughts. That dream was a reminder of my need to be aware of how I watered the roots of my own tree. I have used the idea of that one dream to help create the working notion for Eager's Feast, where the gods themselves decide to create a feast in the depths of the ocean. There's an interesting correlation there, too. It's a tale of gods, to be sure, but it is also a tale of development, of us shedding those parental instructions, which no longer allow us to adapt to our environment. It is a tale set on the ocean where a wonderful meat of cosmic proportions is brewed in a container so vast we cannot imagine it, just like the scope of our own thought process, once we determine how we need to adapt to our new spiritual environment. And that's a powerful concept to even begin to consider that that tale thousands of years old, might be relevant today. But let's go back to that whale. Imagine for a second how truly gigantic a blue whale is. Okay? I'm going to talk about adaption and how adaptation and how great it works. Its heart is as big as a car. Its tongue weighs as much as an elephant. It is 90 feet or better in length. It's one of the fastest creatures, creatures in the ocean. It swims leisurely at 20 knots. The fluke of its tail is the same width as a small aircraft. What if we had the capability to adapt our spirituality to those same gigantic proportions, to adapt to our new environment? What if we knew how to utilize the flows of energy on this earth the same way a whale does? I have spoken extensively about sunlight, birds, and land mammals. I touched base on the structures of the brains of dolphins, whales, and the octopus. The very size and structure of the brains of these creatures suggest that they are smarter than we are. But we decry this idea because they don't use tools. And yet, every time we get a glimpse of them, we see them maybe using a tool. Perhaps this is blind of us. An arrogant type of ignorance, a dangerous position, every bit as precarious as that wonderful vase we set on a pedestal. We have interfered with the migration patterns of every species we share the earth with, but not the blue whale. For the largest creature on the planet, we know very little about its migration patterns or even where they go to reproduce. So we lose a pod of 90-foot creatures somewhere out in the ocean. Okay. See, it's the same thing with dolphins and octopus. We know they are smart. We know they can communicate across vast distances. We know that hunger is not a ready attendant for them as the bounty of the sea appears to be endless. So how do we make such a transition? Is it even feasible, much less desirable? Why should we when the recognized patterns of emotion which drive us today are so readily available? Because those passions and the reckless abandon for the things which seem to make us worthwhile are destroying us. These are the things which are driving us to the spiritual crossroads, which now the numbers of many millions of individuals have, have arrived at. That Odin would take the assembled host of the Aesir to feast in the sea king's realm is a powerful pointer for the spiritually thirsty, because it is in those seas where we also find those flows of energy as the massive currents which drive the weather and tides of the planet, which stimulate the seasonal life-giving rains, and upon which we find those creatures whose intelligence rivals our own.
coasting through the lives they've been allotted. Good lives of abundance, healthy reproduction, challenges of nature to be overcome, the hunted and the hunter, but always the current carries them to a new place. One where they might spread their wings, so to speak, and feast in a cauldron of cosmic proportions. See, it is time for us all to see this. To see these animals with which we share this world. To experience these mighty forests Muir was so fond of. We all have seen the memes of people talking about how wonderful and how great it is to walk in a forest. <laughs> what happens when you come out of that forest? You still going to be able to maintain that mindset? Is it a momentary thing? Are you reacting to the power of life of those trees? You know, walk through that and then, oh, well, okay, that was good. Now I'm going to keep going about the same thing I'm doing because that's what's happening with most people. We'll walk along, be doing pretty good. We'll read the lore. We'll read a book. We'll see a meme. All of a sudden, we're feeling pretty good. We walk out that front door and we go right back to the same old patterns of behavior and we wonder why we're not going anywhere. Why ain't I getting any better at this? Why ain't, why am I not having the success and accolades that other people are? Because we're not adapting to our environment. We're not changing our thought. And that's just that simple, too. <laughs> How many people literally cry for something, anything, to steal the thoughts of their own minds? Look at the success of those memes. Thousands, millions of likes. These are thoughts which no longer carry the heady intoxicant of love and wonder but they now stoop our bodies under a worried brow. We've got to change our thought process. It is sad to see those who cannot make that adjustment, the ones who willingly sacrifice their own thoughts in order to empower another. Such was the portrayal of Loki. Such are the actions of men who willingly subscribe to righteous indignation. They have lost the ability to enjoy wonder and see these great flows of energy which we are perfectly adapted to experience. See them. I don't know how to use them. They're there. But I got all these examples of these gods doing that. Do I have what it takes to do it too? To some degree, yes. Interestingly enough, I find that people will scoff at this idea of flows of energy until you say something like Mercury in retrograde. And then it's a whole different tune. Everybody's paying attention to that shit. But if we have the presence of mind and the technology to do so, we might also find a way to reintegrate ourselves <laughs> into our environment. Being at war with it has been a cancer to the human spirit. We are built and blessed with those great capabilities to build many great things. Things which rival in some ways the great wonders of the ancient world and many things which pale in comparison to them. And every great civilization that has become focused on the great things they can build has failed. We look at their ruins all over the earth. Because those men lost the ability to become a part of the world around them. And that's kind of a scary thought. It's also a very powerful lesson. Look at those great temples in Egypt and Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat's a prime example, the most recent example. That great, wonderful temple was fantastic till the drought hit it, and then they were separated from their environment. They had to leave, and it was abandoned. Same thing with Central America. All those wonderful temples laid out in accordance with the universe and the stars and the, and the constellations, and then a drought hit them, and they were no longer connected to the world they lived in, and it was all left behind. It's like that all over the world. <coughs> we seem at this point to have been able to utilize technology to harness that water so we never have to experience that, except now we've decided, hell, let's poison the shit. So the very water, the air we breathe, all of these things we think we've been able to harness so we can survive in this world and not be a part of it, we've somehow managed to poison it. And technology is going to change that? Or are we going to be able to change our minds to adapt for this new environment, grab a hold of the technology that allows us to be a part of this world, and stop that nonsense, this horrible experiment of pulling carbon out of the ground and putting it in the atmosphere? Hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, people are going to look at that and they're going to shake their head. Every great civilization has failed because men lost the ability to become a part of the world around them. Their great temples dot the various landscapes of the world, just as our ghost towns. Cities founded on just one aspect of living, <coughs> usually being the economic boom of whatever mineral was in the area. All the ghost towns of Nevada and the American Southwest and the gold rush and the silver booms. All of them, new and old alike, 
They exist in ruins because the focus of the mind of man shifted in some small yet catastrophic way from harnessing the flows of energy to damming them up and becoming the very blockage to life medicine attempts to cure in the afflicted man. It is in the wide and encompassing realm of the spirit where man will first find his freedom again. And it is the gods of Osetru who have done it for me. They have set an example which has encouraged me. No longer am I concerned about what will become of me if I accept an idea which others do not understand. As I gain strength in my body, my thoughts become clearer. I find new legs which carry me on to greater adventures. See, there are new and stunning realizations of what it is in the world which is truly important. How wonderful to show the world to this, the wonders of this world to the eyes of this child. Not to give them the instructions of old road markers which have led us astray, but to teach them east from west, north from south, and many more wonderful things. What greater joy might I find on this journey? What greater treasure is worth protecting? To set aside those things in life I had carried and make the stunning realization that I'm still me. To make that discovery of self which empowers one to make the transition between the stages of life. Those things that make a sage a sage do not apply to the things that make a warrior a warrior. You cannot blanket masculinity and say this is toxic and this is good and this is bad. He has things to do at this age. He has things to do at this age. <laughs> to make that far too many in this people world carry around one aspect of themselves and if as if it is this the most important, just like those ancient civilizations, just like Scotty picking Njord by simply his feet, figuring that's going to be the best husband for me. And in their old age, they find themselves alone, slowly returning to the earth, just like those temples and ghost towns. The journey to Eager's Feast began with Odin, for he set, once set upon the mountain, merry as boyhood did he seem, till as a man, blinded he became. When he became blinded by the actions of the beings around him, he led his gods to the sea so that they might feast in some mysterious currents of the deep. Some had to undergo trial and struggle to make it there, notably Thor and Tyr. Tyr had to face the old set of instructions given to him by his father and his mother, and bring out that cauldron, bring out his heritage. He had to separate himself from the teachings that brought him up to be able to grab a hold of his ancestral inheritance. Others tried to get there by murder and deceit. Loki murdered his way in, threw a fit, got in there. He got uh, set down at the table. The serving man was giving, Femifang was given much more attention because he was working his butt off. He was doing his job. He was handling what he was supposed to be doing. He was given all kinds of praise for the hard work he was done. And the uninspired human intellect, not willing to live up to that standard or be confident in who he was, simply killed him right then and there. He was done with it. And he was run off. And he came back in and talked about another person he killed. He tried to get there by murder and deceit. He could not understand where he was at. In some parallels, we have that same problem. We have all discovered in some painful way that we have been blinded as adults. But it is in that blindness where we, now, where we now might begin to see again. We are finding the way to illuminate the darkness of our own minds using the torches of our ancestors. This is the whole foundation of Kenaz, the torch. Every ancestor behind us has one of those torches. And we carry one for our children. <laughs> one has to wonder about the statement in the land of the blind the one-eyed man is king. Could it have been one of those references to Odin? Is this the struggle the other gods must also deal with? Is there an underlying tale describing the efforts of the gods to see? For in the same manner in which we must learn to use the forces of life, and our fumbling attempts to do so, theirs is of a next level challenge. That's how they provide us the example. In their knowing of themselves so much more than we do, they have found an ascendant state of being. These were the musings of Julian the Apostate. And when we carry this forward, do we find the gods learning the consequences of harnessing those flows of life and energy which come to them at their beck and call? I believe that we do. What are the qualifications to carry the fires of human inspiration around one's neck, the Bersingaman gem? What must that vision be like? Well, it might be such that, children, that the children Freya raises are the epitome of treasure itself. 
Both of her daughters are named, name literally means treasure. What were you, what will your vision be when raising your children? Will they be treasures? Or will they be full of the automatic thinking processes, which is the signature of the uninspired mind, the one that's on automatic in this world of today? See, all things continue to adapt and evolve to be most successful in the environment in which they exist. Most of the time when they are successful at it, they will find themselves in the most unexpected and amazing places. The concepts of automation today with regards to our software, our phones, our television, provide us a plethora of programming so we never have to worry about making that adaptation to succeed in the environment we're in. And yet, millions upon millions of us are finding ourselves at that crossroad where it's time to set that aside and begin to adapt to the spiritual environment we find ourselves. And it's going to require some change. It's going to require setting some of these things aside. It's going to require making that sacrifice that Odin makes hanging on that tree. And I had an interesting thought about that the other night. When Odin's hanging on that tree, <clears throat> he's at the moment of death, screaming he fell. How did he fall? Who cut him free? There's only one being I know of that has the potential to cut someone free from death. <clears throat> and she was asked that favor a second time, and she refused because she'd already done it once. But in that moment, the universe brought forth the norms from the base of the tree. And every day, they handle the, 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 uh, the lives of men. And every day, they take that water from the well and the white sand on the bottom of it, and they make a paste, and they, and they reinvigorate that tree that tree, the roots, they cover it because the tree is being eaten by four hearts. It's not, its roots are being gnawed upon by a hog. There's an eagle sits in the crown. There's a squirrel that runs up and down the damn thing. <laughs> it's always suffering these processes. And these processes mirror the thought processes. They are a fine analogy for the human mind. And if you look at the vascular system, if you look at the nervous system, if you look at the vascular system of a tree, if you look at the most recent largest picture of the universe and how it has a time lapse it all shows how it all shows these pathways upon which energy might travel and when we suffer a wound we can either adapt to the environment we're in or we can react like the tree and form a knot or a burl or weep sad but whatever the case may be that's a blockage for the flow of energy from the ground up to the tree where the tree might bring out oxygen and let the, let the dew fall in the dales and reinvigorate or refill the well. It's a cycle there. Those, our thoughts come out of our mind as actions. Those actions are positive or negative, and those positive or negative actions reinvigorate or refill ourselves with the kind of positive reinforcement we need to move forward in this world all kind of a deep subject but it is a powerful subject our ability to see that is what allows us to adapt to the spiritual environment we find ourselves in today <coughs> and it might not do anything for us except that we're not in pain anymore we may have so thoroughly damaged our lives that we may not have an opportunity to be some great champion but we most certainly have what it takes to make sure that our children do. And this is the real story behind Rig visiting those families to create an environment where their children might be most successful at whatever it is they try to do. That's pretty much all I got for tonight, but I thank you for your kind attention. And Brian, what was the song from uh, the, the rock and roll song? Peace Sales by Megadeth. Who? Peace Sales by Megadeth. If there's a new way, I'll be the first in line. It better work this time. I love that song, man. <laughs> Peace sells. Peace sells. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole album. It's awesome. Wow. Well, tell, tell me where to buy it. <laughs> the piece, I mean. So Rig, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you <laughs> well, I appreciate that. That, like I say, that's from the new book Blind that I released uh, Friday. Oh, cool! Thing, I mean, it took off too. It went right to the top. 
and the whole book is it's really pretty good. Not a big book, but it's a good book.